today is Tuesday, March 29th, 2022. We're starting the Diversity, Race, Equity, and Inclusion Subcommittee meeting at 5.44 p.m. Um, we're going to take a roll call to get a quorum. Jared Homer? Here. Um, Kathy? Here. Tony Rodriguez? Here. And Cynthia here. Um, the agenda for today is the overview of the subcommittee, the purpose of the subcommittee, subcommittee common district focus goals, um, the equity, diversity, inclusion office report, and other business. All right, so for the overview of the subcommittee, you have the clicker, Miss yeah. Hale? Okay. You want, well, you want me to click? You could click. All right. Thank I you. <laughs> so the reason why we thought about doing an overview is because we do have new members. So welcome, Jared and Kathy, to Diversity, Race, Equity, Inclusion. And Tony, thanks for continuing working with us. Um, so the overview, we go to the next slide. These are the things that we have done um, since we started with this committee as um, some of you know this subcommittee was established in t uh, at the end of 2020 into 2021. All right, so we've only been about a year, right? About a year or two. Wow, that's crazy. Okay, well. <laughs> um, so the first thing we started with is training on centering equity in policies and practices, which was a training that we also took this year. We started it in March 2021. We learned about the civil rights training that Sharon Walder did across the district. Um, she did a report on that. Then um, in the district review, one of the, um, one of the recommendations or one of the critiques we had is that th we're in the initial steps of understanding issues related to equity and diversity. And I wanna highlight initial steps um, because I think personally we have grown um, from the initial steps. Um, we, one of our biggest goals, and we'll hear um, a student panel, I took a clip of it, um, about hiring more POCs across the district. I think that was a common um, desire across the district to hire more POCs and not necessarily just in the, in the classrooms, but also throughout the district. Um, we did a student panel on engagement um, and the students were also very much engaged in hiring Ms. Haywood. Um, we started and maintained and started maintaining the equity, diversity, and inclusion office, which was a district goal. Um, we did a calendar of important holidays and observations, so a huge feedback that we got from students is it came specifically during Ramadan, students that were celebrating that holiday and were required or were required to take tests. It just felt like it wasn't a great time to take it, just because as we know, students fast until sundown, so we thought, and the, from the students' feedback that a calendar would be great to use in the sense teachers and staff can always refer to it just to be knowledgeable about what's happening, what holidays or observations that maybe their peers, coworkers, and especially their students celebrate. The big question I have on that is how have we been using it? Because it was made pretty quickly um, and it was a great calendar. We could definitely get you to a copy of it. Um, so that would, that would be, um, we would ask that for sure. And then we've been talking about an instructional policy that conduct, that connects to DESI mandates. Um, this is something that we just talked about. So it's one of our goals, but we haven't necessarily d done it yet. Um, and we wanted to specifically talk about the instructional policy because we have a curriculum policy, but talk about how we address stereotype and biases in the curriculum. Um, I don't know if you guys know Chris Edmond. He's the one that wrote the book, um, um, White Folks Who Teach in the Hood. Um, he says, we integrated schools but forgot to integrate the curriculum. And he's specifically talking about when we integrated blacks and whites together in this country. Um, if we go to the next slide, we'll see the 
um, the continuation. So the student panel, again, was on January 19th, 2021, and I thought this panel was very great because students, I mean, they came to a public meeting. It was a, a DREI um we, Sharon and I had prepped them by providing a space before and explaining to them like what is a school committee and went over like, you know, how we behave because we're being recorded, et cetera. I thought that was a great experience. So I just thought, I just took a, it's, it's on YouTube, so you could definitely look, um, look it up. Um, but I took a two minute and 52 second clip just so we can kind of see our purpose as a subcommittee and get that overview. So if we go to the next slide, we can put play and, oh, is there volume on this? Is there volume? Um, and this was via Zoom. This was when we were virtual. Um, there was about six students in total, about six students in total. Um, one thing that we just did discuss at the beginning of the clip was that we would like more representation. Um, oh, we didn't get the audio probably. Those were all high school students? Yeah. You got it? Okay. Um, yeah, so they were all high school students, but they were all from Brockton High. So one observation we've made is that we do, when we get student input, we do want to get more students from the alternative school like Champion, the Huntington. Um, uh, so that was, a, that was an observation that Sharon Walder did, which we tried to include. Yeah, I can do it. Yep. Can you take it back? I'll take it back. <laughs> Yeah, we're ready. You're ready. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Technology. <Back again. laughs> All right, let's do the okay. You got it? So he's a senior in, in um, high school this year.
All right. So, um, so then this just um, kind of clarifies what is the purpose of this subcommittee. So if we go to the next slide, um, so it's just creating a platform specifically for our students, parents, and community, especially those that have been marginalized. Not everything will be about policy. I know that's a huge part of our roles as school committee members, but giving voice leads to changes, and that's basically what Ayana said, right? Like, there needs to be a place in school where she needs to understand where, does, where can there be student voice and who exactly do I go to when I want from my understanding of what she was saying, confidentiality, like where can she feel the most comfortable and who does she make that report to? And not just make it, but actually feel she, if you continue watching the video, um, she talks about there's a difference between being heard and being listened to. Um, so, I mean, these students just amaze me because they just have, they're just the best feedback personally. Um, so not everything will be about policy, but giving voice leads to changes which shapes work also knowing what to do with the feedback and concerns of the voices. So one um, quick feedback that I have seen in the DREI, um, and I've had conversations with Renee and with Mike, is okay, it's great, we wanna build these platforms if we've done it other ways too. Like our strategic plan was huge. Um, I know Mike incorporated a lot of the community members and students, but what are we actually doing with that information that we're getting from our, our fellow Brocktonians. If we go to the other slide. Um, the previous slide? Yeah, the previous slide. Um, before I skipped on, I skipped this on purpose by accident, but there is a copy. <laughs> um, were we able to get a copy on the DEI office? Yeah, so um, Ms. Mendez, what I did is I, because we have newer committee members, I um, actually gave everyone a copy of the EDI conference booklet. And so oh, you can okay. see that mission, vision, and those definitions and focus areas we talked about on pages two and three. Thank you, Ms. Hayward, Welcome. very much. So a if you guys look at the guiding principles, um, here they, um, they define equity, diversity, and inclusion. It looks like this. He's going to get me one. Okay. Um, so one huge thing that I thought, if we're going to move forward in making an instructional policy, having a common language um, where we make similar to what the EDI office made with this spe these specific three words. What is the language we put in the instructional policy and what exactly, how are we defining it? Because as we know, equity could be defined in so many ways, right? But I think if we get clarity, um, similar to the three common focus goals that we now have in the district, right? It's a common language people are using now and everybody knows what they mean and it's been explained and it continues to be um, across schools and central office. So I think the more we could define and become clear with our terminology, the better and more effective our instructional policy will be if we decide to proceed with that. Any questions or comments? Sorry, I like gave a lot out, but it's just because it's the first <laughs> meeting since. That's <laughs> oh, great. Okay. It's really good, like, honestly. So this is something we will work on. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, um, this was our purpose. And we can obviously, this was like our initial purpose, but we can work through this as well. right and then lastly we had um, oh and then talking about common language um, so the subcommittee common district focus goals I thought it would be um, powerful to continue to use these focus areas that um, Mike has established and um, Dr. Zach throughout the district so I thought the best one that would fit this subcommittee from our purpose would be positive relationship so in order to create half platforms a huge part of this especially as elected officials as we know I know Kathy you gave us a great story yesterday of one of your constituents yeah. is this focus goal right the more positive relationship we have the more trust we're going to have on our constituents and the better we're going to advocate for the success of our of our students, especially our marginalized students. So
So we'll have a report from what EDI has done because they're doing a lot of this work as well. Yeah, there's a lot going on in the office and just these are just highlights of um, what's been happening. Uh, and just to start off, um, we'll, I'll be talking about these three things, the affinity groups, uh, kind of then before uh, I came on, uh, actually just months before I came on and then what they look like now. Uh, and then uh, partnerships with schools, and then what we call the SPOS uh, handbook. So the then of the affinity groups and how um, they came about and the leadership of those groups. So uh, DESE, the uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, has an inspired initiative, uh, and it focuses on affinity groups. Um, and this is a way to retain teachers of color and so the uh, vision is all children will have the opportunity to see their ethnic, linguistic, and racial backgrounds represented in teachers and leaders within their classrooms and schools. All educators, especially black, indigenous, and uh, educators of color will be recognized, supported within, and celebrated by their schools and districts for their value and positive impact on PK through 12 students. And why does this matter? Uh, Massachusetts students are increasingly diverse but our educators are not. Research shows that a diverse teacher workforce matters. Teachers of color boost the academic performance of students of color, including improved reading and math test scores, improved graduation rates, and increases, uh, in, increases in inspiration or aspiration uh, to go to college. So there's this thing called the Inspired Fellowship. Uh, and that is a statewide affinity network, um, and it aims to create a safe space for educators of color uh, to come together, network, engage in dialogue um, about their own experiences that are authentic to them, and explore professional development, you know, what will help them grow as educators and leaders, uh, and then um, what makes things more equitable um, in their schools. So the Inspired Fellowship is a selective opportunity for uh, current educators who leverage their backgrounds and personal connections to communicate stories and calls to action to current and prospective educational leaders, helping them understand the impact of BIPOC, which is black, indigenous people of color, on uh, PK um, through 12 students. And so right now we have uh, four of those. I hope I didn't forget anyone, but um, Dr. Michael Robinson, Dr. Soraya Presume, Yvette Joyce, and Maureen Hickey. Carlito Weaver. All right. Okay, that's right. I'm so sorry, Carlito, if you're watching. Uh, and so we have five at this point. So um, most of those five really were involved in what we call SPOS. So SPOS is Supporting People of Color in Education. And this came about because, um, you know, lots of things were happening. Uh, you know, we had the murder of George Floyd, and a lot of our teachers of color were in front of students. We didn't know what to do. And I wasn't there, but I'm, I was in that same predicament. Um, how do we uh, deal with what we're seeing and experiencing as people of color and also supporting our students? So um, SPOS was created uh, as an affinity group um, for teachers of color in the district. And it started off word of mouth, honestly. Um, and a lot of those folks who were the Inspired Fellows were leaders um, of uh, SPOS. Um, and uh, Sharon Walder, she um, was the uh, person from central office who supported them. They needed support. They needed connection. And then uh, when I came on, and in the fall of 2021, um, my office took over the leadership of SPOS. We formalized it district-wide and school-wide, and I'll explain that a little bit more. And this is also part of our retention plan to um, keep student, I mean, uh, teachers and educators of, of color. So school-based, so in every school now, we have a person that um, is um, kind of that, that connection for the teachers of color that uh, they can go to. I think that there are um, different things that they experience in um, predominantly white institutions, uh, and they need um, a space where they can come and talk to someone just to, just to run things by, get extra support. And so we have someone in each of those schools um, and then we also have a central office um, affinity 
group because they said, hey, we're feeling left out, we want one too. Um, and then we also have one for administrators of color to support their retention. And so these groups meet monthly. Um, and as far as the affinity group school-based, there's one person there, but there's also someone um, who is responsible for the elementary schools, connecting with them, making sure that they have the resources and support that they need um, middle school-wide as well as high school. Um, there are two folks here. So um, there's a lot of support, and my office supports them as they support um, the educators of color. And so with regards to um, these affinity groups, I wanted to make those connections to the strategic uh, plan. So this is um, indicator three, or standard three, uh, design, create, and maintain a safe, uh, supportive, welcoming, and inclusive environment of positive relationships where the academic, social, and emotional well-being of the entire school community is supported. 3.1, create a multi-tiered system that is proactively support, that proactively supports the social, emotional wellness of students and staff, builds trusting relationships, and promotes positive school spirit and pride. And then 3.3, recruits, uh, hires, retains um, diverse staff that reflects the district's diverse student population and creates a pipeline for future staff starting with high school students. So they can become what they see, but they need to see it. And working with schools. I put that circle smack dab in the middle because everything that we do has to be student-centered. Uh, and so I could have just um, put these other arrows I'm going to put up there, but I think it's always a great reminder that um, we as adults are here for the kids. So um, here's three things that we've been doing working with schools. We've been working with principals on school culture issues. Um, I've been working with the high school, uh, with the community allies, uh, was um, part of the hiring uh, and uh, the training team and just helping them um, to create a positive environment um, for our young people here. So that's, that's uh, one. Uh, and then planning teams with EDI, the, the EDI steering uh, committee members or school leadership. So um, just to give you an example, I mean, we've been doing uh, kind of smaller um, meetings with um, principals and also workshops. So there was one school that was having a school culture issue um, and they wanted us to just come and do an assembly and tell the kids to knock it off and we knew that um, change doesn't happen like that. Uh, change happens around small tables, having conversations and so um, we did a very brief opening so that everyone could be on the same page, then dispersed into individual classrooms and then did small groups within the classrooms um, around school culture and language and allowed the kids to um, have voice and decide what kind of culture they want to create because it's so easy for us adults to tell them what they need to do and um, there were some who were tempted and I had to let them know you got to back off because this is their space because if they don't own it it's not going to stick um, and so we're still working with that um, school and other schools doing something similar uh, so that we can really drill down and make some change. Um, Another one, you know, there might be an issue that might happen um, within a classroom and we have had restorative conversations so that we could um, hear from the students and uh, get a feel for their, under their um, hurts and, you know, what has happened to them uh, and then we can kind of work through that as the adults. But we wanted to um, give them a space and follow up happens with that as well. And then lastly, uh, we've been providing resources. So um, I said see the handout, and then I realized there's tons of resources in the um, ACT conference booklet that you all have a copy of. And so if you look uh, at the, um, in the back, there's lots of resources. There's also um, podcasts, books, media. Um, there's a glossary of terms, which back then in November, it was just two pages and now we're up to 10 pages. So we've been doing lots of work um, updating uh, the language and um, making sure that we're uh, you know, educating folks. So this is uh, a draft at this point um, and we're just gonna continue to make sure, it, it'll always be a live document, I, I think, because culture um, is always moving and so we need to keep up with the culture uh, and so that's what we'll do. Um, continue to provide resources and, you know, targeted um, support 
with schools, but also uh, district-wide support. So that will continue to happen. And strategic plan connections there. Uh, 1.2, strengthen culturally responsive, high quality instruction that fo fosters student independence. So the independence piece is giving them the voice um, to make their decision on their school culture. Uh, they need stamina. Um, we want to provide, um, and then we want to release the supports um, to, that the students need to access grade level content so that they can struggle productively and become thinkers and problem uh, solvers. So this was their problems to solve and we wanted to give them that space to do so. 1.5, implement a professional development system built on district-wide expectations that promotes culturally responsive practices, student engagement, teacher leadership, and collaboration. And then 3.5, uh, provide opportunities for student leadership, agency, and voice so that students are genuine stakeholders in decision making. And one of those um, workshops that we did, we realized that we need to start working on uh, student councils that have an EDI lens. And so we're, we're, uh, we're trying out a couple prototypes um, with some middle schools soon. Uh, and we've already been in touch with those um, principals. So, uh, We'll learn from that and then see what works. And then lastly, um, we have the uh, SPOS created um, handbook. So what I found out is that um, black teachers have an attrition rate of 21%, which is 60% higher than those of, um, compared to their white counterparts. Uh, it's a similar um, attrition rate to new teachers. So as they're coming in, you get four in, one will leave. And um, a lot of times, it's just hard to connect and find the resources um, to be part of the community sometimes. And so what you have is just um, the very beginnings. Again, it's not a, a comprehensive list. Um, it's all still in draft form, but you have the table of contents that we're working on. And those folks who are in the affinity groups, um, they have all volunteered to take one of the pieces um, on the um, list, uh, uh, the table of contents, and they're doing that research. And then once all that's pulled together, um, we're, we're going to be you know, taking a look at the entire document um, and making sure we're all on the same page with regards to this. But as we were creating this and working with HR on this, um, we realized there's a great you know, intersection there. And so this will um, probably you know, form into something that can be used uh, district-wide. But we're starting somewhere. We're starting somewhere. We just needed to have um, some structure so that our teachers of color have uh, some direction and of course it will be accessible to others so it's not like they're going to get the information and no one else will this was just inspired by those supposed leaders um, and they they're the ones who um, created this piece so um, and then the connections again to the strategic plan um, we're looking at number five, ensure equitable access to resources that foster academic and personal growth in safe educational environments. And then 5.1, work with stakeholders, including students and community, to develop criteria and a system to ensure equitable distribution of resources across the district. And that's, that's my story. You got any questions or comments? Uh, Jared? And then um, Kathy. All right, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, just just quick questions. I, I had two that I wrote down. Um, can you do we know off the top of it how many members of SPOS, How many active members do we have who are working mm -hmm. on putting this stuff together? Oh, uh, oh, this this uh, thing here, the yes, handbook. Yes. Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, I would say 24, 25. Okay. About 24 members. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the second question I had too was, um, and I think this relates to. Um, item five one at the end of the last slide. I was I wrote down a question. I was going to ask how often, um, or in what ways do we hear back from the students and parents? Like what's our what's our mirror that we're holding up to ourselves to kind of get that feedback about mm -hmm. what they see that needs to change or what 
what incidents or what occasions come up that kind of cause concern or that we need to address? Like, how do we how do we get that feedback, and what what do we have in place right now? Thank right. you. <laughs> well, it comes from everywhere. I mean, some you know might be um, a parent calling, uh, a, a student reaching out. Um, I also have a monthly meeting with community members. Actually, a lot of those folks were um, part of the committee that hired me. So um, I figured since they're important for this hiring process, I, I want to continue to connect with them. And so um, we've added a few others as well because we, we saw that there were um, some holes uh, with um, the group that we had. And so uh, I meet with them on a monthly basis. Sometimes it could be nine people. Sometimes it could be um, 18 different organizations, or they might bring an extra person with that organization. And they are Within, they're in the community and, um, and give feedback as well. So I'm hearing it. I, it's from all sides. Jared, I meet with um, my parent advisory council where a lot of the same members mm -hmm. um, right. are on the team that meets with Renee. I meet with them once a month. And I also meet with um, ACAM, mm -hmm. which is um, from BIC. I meet with them once a month. Um, and and then, the NAACP yeah, you NAACP, meet with. NAACP, I am invited to uh, those meetings as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, basically, we they'll they'll talk about they'll send me ahead of time top, topics they want to discuss, and they'll also ask me to bring, you know, guests who do like you know Renee will come, John mm -hmm. Snellgrove, Sharon to talk about different topics if they want to know about, you know, the uh, mental health support we're giving students and families, and you know, so those you know, and I also meet with the members of the um, the community center that run the uh, community center over at at the uh, the guarded so. And that they continue to give us a lot of feedback. Right. I think. Yeah. And what I'm trying to do is break down the silos because, you know, we have lots of different organizations, and we've talked about this as a, a community group, is that there's so much power in us all coming together um, for the kids. And so we're looking at, um, we're continuing to, to get to know each other, um, and then we do want to, you know, plan something uh, and really focus as a group um, towards education for the kids. So. Thank you. Yeah, I, thank you. I, I wrote it down um, when we were watching the video with when the students were talking about where do I go, who do I talk to, like how do I get that. That's why I know, like um, having adults and representatives and the organizations and leaders uh, giving feedback is good. I just didn't know if there was a vehicle for the kids to do that. If there's an email that they use, or if there's a way that they text things, or say I, I need to talk about this issue or that issue, or if there's a way that they have, if we have something in place that they can raise their concerns too. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna. First of all, I wanted to say, um, great job. Like this is amazing. Thank and, you. Um, you know, not to call it anything other than what it is, but this is like yeoman's work because it is building relationships. It's talking to people. It's exhausting work to try to make mm -hmm. something like this happen. It's not creating a spreadsheet, sending it out, and then it's all done, you know. So I have an enormous amount of respect for the time that you've put into, you know, just not only creating this, but creating a plan that has action steps below it. Thank you. I want to go back um, to the student panel, just um, kind of coming off of what Jared had just said. And, you know, with both of them, the first one, which I loved, was his name um, Rakim? Rakim? Rakim, I think. Rakim, okay. Rakim said, better ways to communicate student behavioral concerns. I love the fact that he phrased it concern, and it wasn't like coming right out of the gate hardcore. And so to Jared's point, and also the second, second student said better ways to self-advocate on their own issues. My question is, we just realized it's been a year since this process started. Do those students on that panel, are they expecting us to return back to them? Like, what is their expectation of us? Because if these are the first six that are willing to talk to us, I don't want to fall down on them first. I want to make sure that they feel like they've had a voice. And I love that you bring that up, Kathy, because one thing, when we were virtual, it was easier to meet with them. Mondays, they didn't have class. Classes. Yep. So um, Sharon and I, mainly Sharon, um, we would meet with them for about an hour, two hours now with sports, with all the activities that they are in, they are involved with in Brockton High. It has been difficult to um, have that space. So ideally, as a subcommittee, we want them to be part of this subcommittee, but then the process is how, how they get right chosen. 
Yep. We were just talking about the student rep. How does the student rep? So yep. how would those students get chosen? Which community members would we add? Because that's been a huge goal that we wanted, right? Include more community members and more students part of this subcommittee. Yep. Um, they won't vote, but they'll be um, more of informants. Yes, exactly. And support. So that's a great question. Honestly, I don't have an answer yet. Okay. But a lot of those students, I would like to bring them back, especially before they graduate and leave college. And so then the same thing that Renee was saying, uh, Miss Haywood, sorry, was saying earlier, right? When we retain staff, we also want to make that pipeline where the students see themselves coming back. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what we want to address here too, right? Where students see themselves in position, in elected positions, and being part of the community and coming back to Brockton um so I think that's a huge conversation and I think okay. we should continue it for sure I absolutely do because honestly like we had six students on the panel but the other question that I have is how do we define our own success and so and you know this is solely my opinion but defining our own success would be in the words of our students and so if we're continually talking to them and getting the feedback, both good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, it's no data is bad data. It's going to tell us where we need to go next and what our next decision is. And so I just wanted to make sure that that whole student panel stayed part of what our mission is to keep talking and keep them engaged, because I think that's the most important piece to this. Yes. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Homer, you asked about how many people were part of SPOS. Um, when I said about 24, that mean that's just for the handbook. Yeah. Those are people who are leaders. Okay. I just wanted to make sure because there's a lot more than that. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Haywood, I have to say, um, as a teacher, especially as a teacher of color, I fit under the ethnicity, I guess, category of the vocabulary here. Um, I love this just because I have to say um, it's hard to come into a system and really understand the system, especially an educational system, as we know. Um, like, where do I find resources? Who do I talk? What is a union? Like, what do my union, like, how does my union repre represent me? How do I contact them? What do I contact them for personally? I think those are things that I learned from my white um, colleagues. And a lot of that information is if you have a relationship with them is given. If you don't, it's kind of like you got to you gotta figure yeah. it out yourself. Yeah. Um, so I do think this handbook is a great idea. Do any other districts have this or is this just a Brockton thing? I don't. I I don't think so. Um, no, they don't. Well, the ones that we are with, I, we're part of a network um, of um, EDI, DEI, you know, however you want to move the letters, um, directors or chief um, equity officers or, you know, whatever their title is. Uh, and so we do meet on a monthly basis and we talk about best practice. And we did talk about this handbook and they were jumping on it. So I, I don't think that it is um, anything that is out there yet. So kudos to your office in Sub Brockton. This is amazing. But also on top of that, like if we just look at MTEL prep support, that's a huge one that we have so many educators. I know my own peers that have emergency licenses, right? And that's part of the way that we can't retain them because we can't continue to give them waivers if they're not um, certified. But um, in regards to this, this is amazing. But I was going to say something else. Um, yeah. Oh, I was going to say also, this is also an example of how we can see this in other departments in our district as well. Like what are the policies and practices that we already have written down that a staff member, when they're confused about something, can just have. So I think this is a great starter yeah. for that talk, not just for other districts, but also like keep it in-house in other departments as yeah. well. Yeah, we are partnering with HR because they see the value in that as well so um it yeah yep thank you mm -hmm. any other questions or comments jared I just can make one more comment too i think um putting my guidance counselor hat back on again too i think the idea of recruiting teachers and um promoting that within our school community too and inspiring the kids i think just a, just a shout out to the guidance counselors. Promote that with the kids and the teachers. You know, invite those kids to think about becoming educators too. Because I know that so many of the juniors and seniors I work with, they don't know what they want to do after graduation. 
and they may not even consider education, but it's really important. And it might just be just to push them. Like if you had a good time in high school, you can, you can continue to live that and you can inspire that for other kids. You can serve that purpose for other kids. So I think that's, that's one thing we could all kind of push. We could use our resources to kind of promote that with kids and have the community members or the, the panelists, the students on there too, kind of spread that message too, that we're working to try and recruit and we want them to stay within the community and give back to the community. So. Ms. Ayler, <laughs> sorry, I just wanted to say one last thing. Um, one of the most difficult positions in any organization is being a change agent. Like that is, you're singled out, you know who you are, you know how you were hired. But in a situation like this, I really feel like every single person in this room needs to be a change agent. Like we all have to take on that role to intentionally drive change. When you change, you're, you're leaving something that you've been loyal to since birth for most of us. So it's very uncomfortable, and you have to break loyalties with things that were okay. And once you find out they're not okay, you've got a dilemma and a decision to make. So, yeah. And that's why I said this is sort of like yeoman's work, because you're talking your way through how to be okay with leaving that behind and then taking on something new and a better perspective, yes. if you will. Um, very nice work. I know what it's like to put a PowerPoint presentation together, so thank you again. Thank you. So if we have no more questions or concern, we can move on with our agenda. Okay. Other business? Yes, go ahead, Mr. So, uh, just sorry, I don't know if this is what other business would be, though, but could we make a plan to see if it's possible to get any of the students who were involved to participate in the next time we meet? Just yeah. I don't know how um, we get that out or how we publish that, but that might be a good thing to consider for the next meeting. Yeah, Mike, any suggestions on that? Yeah, I mean, um, Gary Gillito at Brockton High, it, with his new position, has worked with... Um, you know, a lot of students around getting their feedback on how to, you know, the issues at Brockton High, how do we fix those from a student standpoint rather than just an adult standpoint, um, you know, when, you know, um, we were having a lot of issues uh, at the high school, you know, we're quick to rush and say, you know, it's, a, it's all it has to be adults that fix it, where you have so many kids that, um, you know, a majority, most of the kids, like 99% of the kids want a safe and productive and, and um, learning environment. Um, and, you know, they had great ideas and, and they're still working on those. So Gary and Cindy Burns and the uh, House Administration have worked so we can have them reach out. Also, I think we also need to reach out to Sue England, um, uh, Christina at the Edison, Sue England at the Key Center. Um, and Jay Lanner, you know, we, we, you know, we always, when we talk about secondary schools, we, we talk about the high school a lot, but we also have to include uh, alternative mm -hmm. pathways to, because those students also bring a lot to the table of giving us ideas of how to help fix issues. Because um, students usually, a lot of times, know a lot better than us how to fix issues. So, um, and they know how to talk to each other and, and, and um, hold each other accountable. So um, we can get the word out through the principals and through Gary. And I think um, one observation that I made just from um, the work we did last year with the students that were on this panel was providing a safe place before they're coming to this subcommittee. That way, because um, I know some of them, they had to work or they had sports, so they're not all going to be in attendance all the time that we have um, these subcommittees. So I think the more, the better, but also similar to what Ayana mentioned, right? At the same time, we're, we're providing the space for them and then also providing this platform for them to come once they have expressed that in that space. And, um, and it's like an educational lesson, right? Like on social skills, on, on other things. So I do think, um, that's a great, like, we'll continue that conversation for sure. But I want to add parents as well in community. Um, so how to add all those voices as well and how many of them we want to add. Because... Could we utilize Ellen? I mean, she is our student rep. Um, I mean, would we be able to utilize her to try to be able to 
get the word out. I mean, she's meeting with so many different groups. I'm just saying, like, that might be a way, student to student, for her to say, I'm part of the school committee. This is the self committee. I'm just saying, like, that, that might be another way for us to be able to tap into a few more students that are like she is involved and want to speak and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I, I like that idea, uh, Ms. Ayler. The only pushback I have on that is we do want um, more of the marginalized perspective, and that doesn't mean those students are necessarily heavily involved, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think when we think about involvement, we also have to consider privilege and having the privilege to be involved in certain things at school. And um, I think that's a great perspective, but we don't want to just limit to that. But I do think Ellen would be a great resource to use, yeah. for sure. Yeah, was, even if, like, I know the kids are involved in activities and things now, too, but even if they had a, a vehicle just to express themselves, if it's an email or anything like that, that even if we read it or shared it for them, um, just to give voice to their concerns, too, and acknowledge them, um, you know, it would probably be more helpful, like like Kathy had said earlier, just to get the more data, just get more input from the kids. And I just think that just like getting a kind of like a finger on the pulse of what is happening, what are they seeing, how do they feel things are going, um, that would be helpful for us as a, as the committee to kind of to review what we need to do, what what should the next step be. But like we said in the PowerPoint, focus on what the students are seeing, what their experience is. So even if they can't come in person, if we had a way to just get their input, it would be really good to do that. I got one. Yeah. Um, Ms. Ayler and then Mr. Rodriguez. So I, I don't, I, I'm, I feel really ignorant not knowing the answer to this question, but um, we do this all the time in college. Do we survey the students? What if we did a student survey what if we did an all student survey on like who wants to be involved with the subcommittee just some of the questions that we need answered not even oh. just do you know what i'm saying yeah. like what if we did a global survey in general of doesn't matter who's marginalized who's not marginalized but why don't we just get a feel of what everybody's thinking out out there and do a survey on diversity race equity inclusion and ask questions like who even understands that? And then figure out what part of the population this is even resonating with and what part of the population it isn't. Yeah. Because I, I really believe that this speaks to the people. Well, let me put it this way. This speaks to some people, but to other people, it's in their periphery until it matters. So I don't mean, I don't mean Sorry. to go over you, Mr. Rodriguez, but I wonder, I think the survey is great. I think we sent a lot of surveys for feedback. That's like our number one vehicle to get. So I wonder if somehow we can collaborate with either EDI or the people that um, Mike mentioned, the um, administrators, yeah. on getting clips. I, I have found that from my experience, a huge vehicle is like asking a question and clip and having certain clips. Mm -hmm. So instead of like a panel similar, but they'll be recorded and they'll answer a question or two. And I think that would be okay. um, better feedback on the spot versus a survey. I wonder if they're thinking, am I saying the right thing and then change it, you know? Yeah, it would have to this be anonymous, yeah. you know what I mean? But what I was saying is to get a temperature check globally of where we are in the school, in the high school, just the high school, like let's just take the high school and see where we are with the kids that come in and out of these doors every single day and what their real thoughts are, what percentage of them does this resonate with and what percentage of this we're, we're not even getting to. That's all. Mr. Rodriguez? I just wanted to touch base on, like, you know, as far as with the survey, um, a, a good idea is almost if, you know, we could have like a photo booth set up in each house and have a camera there and kind of have the questions list out and have these kids come in because they will, they will take advantage of it. You know, just go in there. It's like almost like a confession. Close it and, you know what I mean? It gets recorded and, you know, it could go we to the office and, that. you know, not, not a confession, but, you, you, know, you know, answer the questions and, you know, you'll get a better feel um, personally of, you know, how the student feels. Yeah. To Jared's point, whatever vehicle is going to work, but to, the data is the most, the feedback and the data is the most important to tell us what our next step should be. That's how I look at it. Other business, does anybody have any other questions or concerns? Um, in other business, um, I know some of my peers on the school committee talked about the training 
um, and somehow trying to become that a policy where we don't have a number tied to it. I know every time we have voted, we have said three hours or six hours. Um, so that's also something that I want to um, bring up. Um, and I'll talk a bit more internally about that, but a policy on the training, if that's going to be annually or that's going to be biannually, um, and if that's effective to have for us as a school committee. Um, so I'll be honest, <laughs> I feel like my the follow-up, I struggle with that in the subcommittee because <laughs> like I have this whole list of follow up. Right. And I understand like um, there's collaboration here. But what's the best way to follow up with these things, Mike? So we'll, um, Lisa will pull up, uh, pull out of the minutes the things we need to follow up on. And then we can email that to the, all the committee members. And then I'll follow up on the things you need me to follow up, like a photo booth, the, you know, who we reach out to. I can T ask Jess to get you the results of surveys that have been done in the past so you have those. You also have the surveys that the stud students are taking surveys now with the MCAS. Those results go right to the Department of Education. They're very powerful uh, that they do, they, you, know, they, you get a lot about um, how the students feel about the school through the MCAS survey um, on school climate and culture. Uh, those will be coming in though, you know, we usually get those those results sooner than you get the actual test results. So we'll probably get those in sometime mid-June. Um, and, um, you know, we'll get you those. Those are very effective. And again, that only gets to 10th graders. And, but we could, figure, you know, see what Jess has done in the past and see what questions you want to keep, which ones you want to add. That way you don't have to, you know, you can, you, you can let her know whether you want to keep some of the questions that were sent out before uh, or you want to do a whole new one and then we can get those out and I think again I, I recommend we if you're going to target high school students that we do it for all of our high school students Edison, Brockton High, the Key Center and the Huntington as well. Yep. Is there anything else under other business? All right. Um, I'll take a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Second. All right. Jared Homer. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> Kathy Sorry. Ayler. Yes. And Tony Rodriguez. Yes. And Miss Mendes. Yes. Um, this meeting has been adjourned.